Good evening. Good evening, brother. Brother Pastor. Uh, this evening, we're going to be looking at um, another one of these sessions on revival. Last week was return. This time it's return to your first love. Revelation chapter 2, 1 through 7 will be our passage. It will follow in, in a few moments, so you can be getting ready by looking for that. And uh, Dr. Berger, when we get to that point, I'm asking you to volunteer to read it. Okay? So, um, we'll, I'll let you know when to read in, in just a few moments' time. But we want to talk about that for a few moments, and we want to talk about what God said to John when he was on the Isle of Patmos, and um, the Lord Jesus Christ came and spoke to him. This is not John's revelation, by the way. It's a revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, I have a question for you. Um... I want to talk about hobbies for a minute. You think, what has that got to do with love? You'll get there. But I want to speak about hobbies for just a few moments' time. And um, I want to ask you this. Y'all tell me some of your hobbies. Reading. Reading. Tennis. Tennis. I like to build stuff. This guy likes to build stuff, and he puts it on Instagram and tries to sell it, too. <laughs> Part time assignments with the grandchildren, helping them. Helping grandkids. Crafts. Crafts. All right, let me ask you this. What are some hobbies you used to have, but you just, you know, they lost their appeal to you somewhere along the way? Sure, baby. I ain't sure it's very much. I got some time. <laughs> I used to paint shirts too. I'd paint the wall, but most of it would get on me. <laughs> I used to cross stitch. Cross stitching. I used to cross stitch. Watching television. I used to rock climb. Um, I felt like I lived in Mississippi. Rock climber. <laughs> we have one somewhere here in the state. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Facebook. Facebook. Well, that's an addiction that some people need to repent of. I mean, I didn't say that. <laughs> Our cameraman's having some throat problems up there. <laughs> oh, my goodness me. Well, the, v the video we're going to see, we're going to talk about a church that was once in love with Jesus and they just lost interest in him. And, uh, Are they going to ever tell us what the 6 o'clock means? It's time to wake up. 6 a.m. <laughs> yeah. So, this video, this video is going to share with us uh, a little bit of truth Dr. Floyd wants to share with you. Y'all listen. And so, Here's something hard to answer. Um, in what ways have you experienced a wandering from your first love? Getting so busy that you stop sharing with others about Christ. That's been my problem, but you know what the answer is? When you go back and ask, invite them to church again, they're always going to ask you, you mean you still care? Don't give up. Well, what other ways do we tend to wander away? 
think idols, you know. Setting up idols in the heart? Maybe that may be even good things, you know. We pursue over him. How about prayer? I think that is most often in my case. Um, I can't speak for the rest of y'all, but in my case, that's the first and foremost barometer. I don't spend as much time with the Lord, you know, um, when I start growing cold. And um, I don't spend as much time letting the Lord speak to me. Reading, I may read, and keep on reading, but it, it's so perfunctory that I'm just going through the motions. What do you think would happen if our church um, returned to the Lord? What, how would it impact, if you, just you, impact, how would it impact the church? Okay. If you have wandered from the Lord and you were to return wholeheartedly to the Lord, what impact would it have on this church on 38th Avenue? Okay. Okay. Anytime that I see someone who I think they are wholeheartedly, like they're all in, it's challenging and convicting to me. Seeing somebody that's wholehearted, that's all in, challenges and convicts me. And we could all agree with that. So my inference, if others see us as all in, it would challenge me. Exactly right. And so by inference, that goes all the way out into the community, doesn't it? We would hope. And that goes into the community for everyone around us. All right. My volunteer that I volunteered, read for us our passage in Revelation. Through the angel of the church of heaven, these things, says he, holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from, the, from its place, unless you repent. For this you have that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst Thank you. So here's a question for you. What's your initial reaction? Reading those verses, what's your initial reaction? Sadness. Pay attention. 
It makes me think of 1 Corinthians 13. We can do a lot of things and do a lot of work, but if we don't have love, it's, it's all in vain. Makes makes me think of Corinthians, First Corinthians thirteen. We can do a lot of work, do a lot of things, but if we don't have love, it's for nothing. This reminds me of uh, Thursday night. We talked about how at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, he says, "Many will say to me, Lord, Lord." They were doing like all these ministries, you know, and uh, that really didn't mean anything. It was it was him. It's all about him. Reminds Nick in in their study in the Sermon on the Mount on Thursday night. If if y'all didn't hear that, um, ministry over Jesus. People choosing ministry over Jesus. There's a there's an admonition in there too. So if you don't do all this, I'm gonna come get your laps. Yeah, that admonition that's sitting in there. If you don't do these things, I'm coming to get your lampstand. Really encouraging um, the way God is communicating to us with such an integrity and genuineness because He's commending them on several things and at the same time He's convicting them on a specific thing. It sounds a whole lot like a father who loves and guiding the life. He's not just up there saying, You messed it up. Good. Thank you. All right, let me ask you a question. Um, let's do some comparing and contrasting. And let's talk about doing things for Jesus, ministry, versus spending time with Jesus. Let's, let's clarify those things. And what's it like when you're spending time with Jesus? And, and what's it like just doing things for Jesus? Can, does, does that come across the way I'm, I'm hoping it does? What's it like? Compare it for me. Okay, your focus is on the Lord Jesus instead of these things that are around you. Did I say that? Okay, Dr. Berger. Good example is Martha was doing a lot of things. Mary was spending time with Christ. Her father came. The struggle with her sister. And Jesus prays. Spending time with Jesus leaves you fulfilled, whereas working can leave you weary. I like that. That's good. That's very good. So what can we do to evaluate whether we've lost our first love for Jesus or not? What's a good, what's a good way to evaluate? What can we do? I think ministry that comes out of spending time with Jesus won't leave us weary in the same way. Okay. Doing ministry, trying to do ministry without the time spent. Ministry is a result of the overflow of spending time with Jesus. Doesn't leave you weary. And that can be that can be the measuring stick too. If our ministry is really wearing us out, if the works that we're trying to do are burning us out and leaving us so weary, then we probably are not spending. A good measuring stick is burnout in ministry, in, in those things that you've been called on to do. Because he tells us to not grow weary and do good. Yeah. So there is a way to do good and not grow weary. There has to be a way to do it. He tells us to do it. Exactly right. Look at verse 5. Somebody read verse 5. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent, and do the works you did at first. Not, I will come to your move, will that stand? 
That verse by itself, he tells us some things that he wants of us. So here's the question. Uh, what's it look like for a Christ follower to repent? We talk about non-Christ followers repenting all the time. What we forget sometimes is repentance is basically an attitude that should be carried through in all of our life uh, uh, it, it constantly. It should be right there in the forefront of our minds, um, this attitude of repentance. But what's it like for a Christ follower to repent? What's that look like? Okay, coming before God and confessing and asking forgiveness. Let me just back up completely and what is repentance? Turning, turning from sin. Turning from sin is repentance. So when a Christ follower repents, he's doing what Peggy said. Exactly right. So, sometimes churches need to have a good day of repentance, don't they? They used to do that. At least where Pam and I went to church when she was, uh, she grew up in that church basically in Big Creek over there. The preacher would get up and he'd do a backdoor uh, invitation. If you're right with God, you come take my hand this morning. And um, he would. And of course, they you know, people are gonna line up because they want they don't want to be the ones sitting out there saying I'm not right with God. <laughs> you know? So there'd be some fast repenting going on in in that moment among some, or at least might be false repentance too, uh, taking place. But but sometimes we need we need as churches opportunities to just. Repent. What kind of venue could we set up where that would feel safe to us? What do you think? I have ideas. What do you think? Encourage people to use a prayer room. Encourage folks to use a prayer room. I'm thankful for the men that go in there while I'm preaching um, and pray. I'm thankful for that. But there are other times that we could be using that prayer room in there. What else? Maybe before we have communion, to have a, not that same day, but maybe a day or two before, or the Wednesday night before or something, to have a, a time. A time of reflection before we, a time of reflection before we have the Lord's Supper, a few days earlier. By the time we get into the actual communion service, it's, it's almost too late. Feels, feels rushed. Right. Yeah. I think, you know, with any kind of repentance, you have to recognize sin first, right? So any kind of venue or attitude, even in our relationships, where we can confess sin between ourselves and to have that kind of accountability in a smaller setting, you don't want to do that for everybody, but, you know. Create a setting whereby we could have an intimate accountability and confession time. You know, um, do y'all remember back in 2011 before we had our spring revival in 2011? Um, we did a number of things. One of them was Fresh Encounter. Y'all remember that? But we also, I gave to you at that time a, about a five page sheet. I may have condensed it down to four pages by changing the font or something. But uh, it had this series of questions to ask there. And that was for the whole purpose of seeking repentance for prayer and revival. 
Maybe I need to pull that out every once in a while. What do you think? And um, as we've already talked about, one of my ideas related to the Lord's Supper, and the Lord's Supper is the best time for a church to come and examine itself and repent. Uh, but we've gotten, uh, I don't want to use the word flippant with the Lord's Supper, but in a lot of, lot of instances, that's what happens, honestly, um, with individuals. Um, you know, I don't know how to avoid that, but it is some of the things that happens. Well, I've got, um, I've got another question for you. And this question's really going to be our um, wrap-up question for this evening. But when people choose to return to the Lord, because people should choose to return to the Lord, we had some of that this morning, uh, when they choose to return to the Lord, Sometimes they run into obstacles. What kind of obstacles do you think would be in the way of a person who wants to return to the Lord? We're talking about Christ followers now. We're not talking about uh, unsafe people here. Shame. That could be an obstacle, seriously. People realize, think I'm really doing well and I have to stand up and, and uh, now admit I'm not doing so great. Okay, expect possibly in some cases bitterness from brothers, brothers in Christ in this case. Or it could be your physical brother. It certainly could. Lifestyle changes that could be difficult. I think in some cases related to that lifestyle change, some people are going to look at you and they're going to say, well, I sure liked you better the other way. And you're going to lose friends over it. And loneliness can be an obstacle, can't it? It certainly can. But here's the thing. The Lord told us three things here. Well, really two. He said, remember and repent, you know. Remember from where you've fallen. And then repent. And the whole thrust of repenting is returning to the Lord. So remember and repent and return to the Lord. That's what he says to us. That's where the challenge is for us this evening. Remember, repent, and return. So this is what I want you to do. You don't have to do it right now. If you want to do it right now, you can, but I think it takes some reflection. You need to write down the top three things that describe your Christian walk when it was healthiest. When you were doing your best. And then try to look at habits that might contradict those top three things. And confess them to the Lord. And then determine to return to Him. And how are you going to do that? What needs to happen for you to return to where you were? And, and y'all, I'm, I'm going to be very honest with you, um, very open. There's no one exempt from this. Pastors, staff members, um, any of us face this. I remember a time that Pam and I lived in... Um, in southern Peru, in Arequipa, where we're taking the team this year. And I was in my study, which was behind the house, in a separate small building on the second floor. And I was by myself and preparing a message. 
and I wanted to use a message I had preached in an earlier time in my ministry and I got to looking at that and looking at what I said then and comparing it with what I was experiencing in that moment several years later and it was a very humiliating moment for me to recognize that I had gone from this kind of fire to something different and I had a long time of anguish in my heart sitting there by myself as you said earlier trying to find that fire that had diminished so much sometimes it's hard but we can return if we will if we will they'll close us in prayer